Welcome to Civil Line and Nation, and this is season six and episode two. And today, guys, I have one of my sponsors here. This is Kelly, y'all, and I'm her sponsor. So that means that I get to tell her what to do. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, Kelly actually has seven years this month. So this is her birthday month. So I'm really glad that I get to interview you on your birthday, girl, because we've been doing this, and this is the first time I think I've asked you to be on Civil Lightning, right? Mm -hmm. So that's her birthday gift, guys, from me. So Kelly um, has actually been in rehab, and that's what this season is about. It's about people that have actually gone through rehab, and they're sharing their experience with you guys with how it is, what they do after they get out of rehab to stay sober. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and let her take the floor, y'all. So Kelly, just take over. Okay, um, do you want me to talk about rehab? Talk about rehab, talk about whatever you want, but yeah, yes. tell them about rehab to let them know about your experience with rehab. Okay, um, my name is Kelly. And uh, yes, um, I did uh, I think about 35 days in um, rehab. Um, when I first got there, I was uh, still drunk, very foggy. <laughs> um, my parents suggested it and I had, I had hit my rock bottom. Um, I had tried sobriety before. I tried it on my own without a sponsor. I just thought coming to a couple of meetings a week and hanging out with people would keep me sober. And um, so when I hit my rock bottom and I went to uh, rehab, um, in the beginning, um, the first couple of days. What was the name of the rehab center? Nexus. I went to, I went to Nexus okay. in Mesquite. And um, it's a first come, first serve. So, so we got, you don't have to have insurance. No. Okay. That's good to know because yes. a lot of uh, recovery places do. And a lot of people, you know, when we're in our disease, we ain't got no money. <laughs> no, I had recently got myself fired. Mm -hmm. So uh, my parents are the ones that had called for me. And then it was first come, first serve. And we got mm -hmm. up there early in the morning. And by God directing traffic, they had a bed for me. And um, I was ready to get started. And in the beginning, you have to stay in a unit and they have to kind of watch you um, to make sure that you're not going to have withdrawals or anything. And so they monitor you to make sure that you're you're not going to have withdrawals, seizures, okay, okay. anything. And um, I was kind of a little irritable, restless and discontent. And I wanted to get started. And I was kind of given some pushback because they were really trying to just make sure that I was okay. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I want to get this started. I know what I'm doing because I always know what I'm doing. I'm in control. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, yeah, so you have to stay in the unit for a few days for them mm -hmm. to monitor everything. And then you get to start going to classes with other people, counselors, and they mm -hmm. have people that come in that um, speak and uh, they pretty much just stay on step one about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your life being unmanageable, which of course mine was. And they always encourage to get a sponsor immediately. I mean, immediately. And um, I do remember after a couple of days, because I was like, hey, I wanted to get out of there. I called my father. I was like, this isn't working. They're not letting me do what I want to do. And he was like, you know, it's a blessing you're there. And he said, they stopped because I got a DWI. Everything was on hold until I went through this. And something came over me and I was like, I got to do this. So mm -hmm. I dug my heels in and started going to every group that I was allowed to go to. And uh, it's very strict, which I needed that. You know, how long did it take you before they you had earned the opportunity to leave the center the rehab? Thirty, I think I was, it was almost thirty-five days. Okay, because yes. you have to earn. They don't just let you. That's a privilege, right? Uh, no, if you want to leave, 
-hmm. you can leave. But, and that's kind of what I put in my head was, oh, I can leave if I want. Okay. However, um, that would be the end of it. And so. If you leave, they don't let you come back is what you said. You got to wait. Yeah, because okay. the state was paying for that and they uh, it was the director. And unfortunately, I don't remember her name um, that my dad and my stepmother had uh, spoke with and um, got everything stopped, you know, because um, I had that DWI. And so they really Nexus really went above and beyond to help me so that I could work the program. But mm-hmm. I had to work it. I got a counselor while I was in there. And the great thing about it is that they are as well in recovery. So my sponsor had a lot of recovery and that really helped. Um, One thing was after, after I got to start going to some of the meetings and stuff, um, I was still thought I knew everything. And so um, not, no, not you. Right. <laughs> and I was, uh, yeah, I was like, why are they not going to their meetings when I have to go? And they, and this is where I learned stay in your own lane. And um, yeah, so uh, I did start going to the meetings and I remember um, it's stadium seating and there was a speaker that had come in and I remember them saying 1% is going to make it in this room. And I think that's really when I had one of my first spiritual experiences that it scared me so bad. I immediately picked up my, I'm getting chills now. I picked up my stuff and I went down and I sat in that front row. And for the rest of my time there, I stayed in the front row. I was um, open to receiving anything that they had to give me. I wanted to be that 1%. Because I knew that this disease was going to kill me. And what they did, we had we had all sorts of meetings and stuff. I got involved. I worked in the, the um, kitchen and stuff. But it was actually opening up and admitting that I could not. I was powerless. I, this disease was going to kill me. This was the worst I'd ever been in my drinking career. That I did not remember a lot of like the last month. I knew I wanted to die. That's all I knew. And by the grace of God, they gave me the tools. And what I really liked was that the people that work there, even the volunteers, these are people that also are in recovery that have been working a program as well. So you feel that connection. Um, They don't baby you. They're direct with you. But yet they have a lot of compassion. And empathy, but what they do stress to you is this is your program, and you cannot just be in because I felt very safe there. And as I got closer to getting out, here came my fear because they kept me in line. Because if you get infractions, they can throw you out. Mm-hmm. And that I mean, I I didn't want to be thrown out. I knew this was my this was it. This was my rock bottom, but they did it. I mean, every meeting I went to, whether it be with the counselor or groups, they said, you must get a sponsor when you get out because the second your feet hit the pavement, because of the way we think we have a thinking problem, you, and if you go back to the same people, same places and same things, playground, you're going to relapse. And when they started talking about relapse, I was like, Ooh, I don't want, I don't want to hear that. That's not going to be a part of my program. Well, it is. And, um, so as soon as I got out, because I had talked to her before I went in, as soon as I got out and I got home, I called Lorene and she met with me and I was like, Hey, you're going to be my sponsor. And she explained to me, this is your program. And I'm not going to work any harder for you than you are. And um, I knew that I had picked the right person because I needed someone that was not going to tell me everything I wanted to hear Mm -hmm. that you were going to give me suggestions. And and the most important thing I thought was that when you told me that you will share your experiences with me as well, but I was not alone in this. And because even though I know all these people in here have the same problem, I was scared and I did everything that you told me and, you know, sit down, be quiet, (laughs) sometimes keep your mouth shut. 
Um, but that's what I did. I had to, I mean, I was in fear even when I got picked up. All I could think was I got to get home and call this woman and see if she will sponsor me because rehab is just, it's just a starting point. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And for the first 35 days, it's, I'm coming out of a fog. I am, I'm literally still shaking. Um, I was, uh, depressed sometimes, scared. Can I really do this? And because it's a lot, it is. And um, I come from a family with alcoholism as well. But and your father has how many years now? He'll have 52 in December. Wow. And I have an older brother that's, I think he's got 36 years. Um, and that it is, it is. And all they all they told me, because I didn't call and get advice from them about this. They just supported me. And that was super important was me having my own program. What does it look like for you is what you kept saying. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want out of this? Mm -hmm. And what I wanted was to never drink again, to never do anything that was going to alter me um, and put me back in that, that hopelessness. Yeah. And coming in here and being with you and being around other people where I could say what was on my mind and to other people that have never dealt with this mm -hmm. that say, oh, drama or, oh, just get over it. Just stop that. The people that I surrounded myself with, like you told me, I want you to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. I want you to participate when you need yes. to and listen. Mm -hmm. Call me. Um, I don't want to ever hear you say, Kelly, oh, I didn't want to bother you. And don't call me after you've picked up. You always call me before. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to learn that, you know, that you gave me your number and you said you would be my sponsor for a reason. So you expected a late yes. call or a drama call. <laughs> And sometimes, like I said, you tell me just to pray about it. And I was like, no, I need an answer. And she's like, no, sometimes you just need to sit and be quiet. Because I don't always know the answer. And you've told me that before. Mm -hmm. And that is that is why I've kept you in, for seven years um, by the grace of God is because you have taught me it's okay to be vulnerable. And even in my sobriety, I don't graduate. I still... Yes. I still, you have to, you have to work through things because other things are going to come up is what you told me. And right. if I'm full and I haven't let that go and work through it, I don't have room for the other stuff. Yes. And yes. that is what has happened recently. Why I have started calling you more mm -hmm. and leaning on you. And just, even if it's a text saying, Hey, I love you. Mm -hmm. And you giving that back to me lets me know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. There's a connection. And we need that. Exactly. Need um, that. Because like I said, um, we have to learn to live after we're in recovery and in the real world. And that's scary when yeah. you. Because being in recovery, it sounds like it um, pushes you yes. from, from the real world. Because I was uh, interviewing um, Christina and you know Christina and you guys. Christina and um, Kelly came in at the same time, guys, by the way. And we were talking about um, when you get out of rehab, mm -hmm. uh, that feeling. Tell the views about how you felt when you got out. Were you frightened? Were you, did you feel like you wasn't walking on, you know, stay? Well, I, I finally got comfortable in there in my surroundings mm -hmm. and when it came time to leave I got antsy again mm -hmm. I was like mm -hmm. there's nobody there to monitor me it's mm -hmm. just me yes and that was very scary and so when I got home that day uh you know I couldn't sit because I'm still doing the thinking thing in rehab they keep you busy mm -hmm. you're constantly going to meetings you're hearing speakers that's the great thing is that they bring in speakers that have been in Nexus before. That's, that's, and with a lot of sobriety, 
-hmm. And when they tell their stories and you're like, oh, that's me and that's me. I started realizing that even though it's not the same speakers, Mm -hmm. it was still I had something in common with them. And fear is one of the most common um, feelings that you get when you're going to leave if you want to be successful because you're like, I'm going to be alone at some point um, and I have to be accountable. And that scared me. And so I wanted to, I wanted to surround myself with the same type of people that I had just been in there with that got me. And that's why when you and I met, you were telling me you've got to hit meetings. You've got, you gave me a list of numbers. You told me that about, you know, my, about my, your sponsor. Mm -hmm. And so having a list of numbers, Mm -hmm. because like you said, if, even though you are my sponsor, Mm -hmm. if you, if I can't get a hold of you, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you don't care, Mm -hmm. but do not hesitate to dial another number. Mm -hmm. That's what this is about. And that you don't own me, that you are my sponsor, Mm -hmm. but you want me to learn to reach out to other people and get that connection Mm -hmm. because I can't just have a connection with her one person because then you become enabling. Well, I'm just going to call her and she'll tell me what to do and stuff like that and calling another alcoholic Mm -hmm. and sharing something with them and them being able to connect with me. And even if they don't give me an answer, just me sharing my, my thoughts and my fears or the situation with them and them saying, well, Hey Kelly, I can tell you what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, It's so comforting because we get in those moments Mm -hmm. where it's got to happen right now. Mm -hmm. And it's, you don't always get the answer, but just Mm -hmm. being able to relax and know that I had a, and you told me you keep getting numbers Mm -hmm. when you go to meetings you need to say, hey, can I get your number? Mm -hmm. That's what we do is we network with each other. Yes. And that's so important. That's how we get to know each other. So when we are going through um, certain situation, life life lessons, Mm -hmm. then we can remember and say, oh, this person has gone through something similar. Let me give this person a call. So that's the beauty of part of recovery and being in having a home group and getting to know people in your group that's that's the lesson that I wanted to make sure that you got yes and the going to women's meetings I was like oh (laughs) man I don't want to go to that because (laughs) and it was the best thing Mm -hmm. because um they were just the opposite of what I thought they were sharing experiences Mm -hmm. that you know, only women in women's groups will yes, share. Yes. And then afterwards, everybody going to breakfast mm-hmm. and I still, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. And not always just talking about recovery, but they'll be talking about something that is going on with them mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. even though they're not putting it in a recovery aspect, mm-hmm. as they talk about it and how they handled it yes. can help me. Yes. And sometimes people don't even realize that hearing them say something can give you comfort. Mm-hmm. It's it's just been amazing. You know, the first the first year, you're still just trying to figure this out. Mm-hmm. Um, all I knew though was that I wanted this. Mm-hmm. And when I saw other women that had a lot of time and they were still sharing experiences mm-hmm. that I'm going through, but they're showing you how to walk through it because. Mm-hmm. We as alcoholics, if we can't control it, we want someone to give us the answer. Well, how do I just get to next Tuesday where I don't feel like this? Yes. And one of your best sayings is, it's just a feeling. You'll get through it. <laughs> and like you said, the purpose of getting, of walking through this and working through it is learning how to live life on life's yes. terms in mm-hmm. a sober way. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, we struggle with being addicts and alcoholics. We, that's why I drug and drink. Would it be more difficult for you if you hadn't went to rehab to uh, have some time to recover? Do you think that you, you needed rehab in order Absolutely. to Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, like I said, for the last few weeks of before I went into Nexus, um, it was a fog. I was I was getting up and drinking in my sleep. Like I would get up. And, I mean, I was already out there, and it it yeah. it that's a. I mean, I, if I did not go to a rehab where somebody that could help me that had mm -hmm. the experience that mm -hmm. had what they had, the people there. And if I was going to die, yeah. I had already been in the hospital and the doctor had told me, if you keep this up, you're going to die. I needed to be in a place with other people that were struggling like me, just going to a hospital and being in ICU and having somebody watch me is not the same experience as mm -hmm. going into a rehab. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was that you can go to rehabs because I hear people say, oh, that one didn't work. That one didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was, I could see the fear in my parents' eyes, mm -hmm. my father and my stepmother. Yeah. Um, you and, thought, do you think they thought they were going to lose you? Yes. Had you not gone? Yes. And I, I would have because mm -hmm. I was so hopeless. I was like, I can't fight this. Mm -hmm. I had gone, I had had some sobriety, like I said, but I never had a sponsor mm -hmm. and I wasn't working the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. I thought just mm -hmm. going to a meeting on Friday evenings and hanging out with people, but they all encouraged me. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kelly, you need to get a sponsor. I was like, ah. And so I thought just being around them, mm -hmm. but not knowing about the, the steps. Uh -huh. And so being in rehab, they don't force you. They're, they're not saying you're an alcoholic. Okay. It is for its same thing as coming to meetings and mm -hmm. having a sponsor. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like your life has become unmanageable? Mm -hmm. That was what, because I thought it was going to be, they were going to be telling me what to do and do yes. this and do. And it wasn't like that. It mm -hmm. was the same thing that you have told me is mm -hmm. if you want this, then we're going to help you, give you the tools mm -hmm. to get you started. But what rehab says is we can't, we can't take care of you the whole time. Like you're, you're only going to be here for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And even in my counseling meetings, you need to get a sponsor. And I kept telling them, well, I've got yeah. this lady <laughs> that she said I could call. Exactly. And yeah. she said, call yeah. me as soon as you get out. So mm -hmm. I had that in my back pocket yeah. that I wasn't going to be alone. It was worth it. Or are you going to be willing to sponsor me? Well, you know how often that happens? You know, when people say that they're going to call you when they go to uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. But once they get out, you never hear from them. Yes. But you were, it was different with you. You actually, you actually followed up. And that's why I showed up because you kept your word. Yes. And that, that that made a huge difference. Well, like they like they said in Nexus, you can't even go, don't get out and go see your friends and call mm -hmm. this because yeah. the one thing I had to change was everything <laughs> and don't yeah. lean on your family because yeah. I had done enough to yeah. them. I had the sleepless yeah. nights, mm -hmm. my daughter, stuff like that. So mm -hmm you're not to go and lean on them mm -hmm. and say, oh, I'll go in a week. It yeah. was as soon as you leave here. Yes. And I, they, they drilled that into my head and I knew that there were other girls in there as well that had temporary sponsors through okay. other people that they had already connected with before they went in. But okay. You, but, so they did the same. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I, the little, group that we had mm -hmm. that we housed with um, in that one building. There were a lot of them that they already had somebody picked out mm -hmm. and I had called you, but you told me to call when I got out. <laughs> yeah. So I knew to call you immediately and mm -hmm. get this start, keep it up. Don't, yes. don't let any days lapse because mm -hmm. if I was to wait two or three days, like they said, that's when the thinking starts and I'm like, Oh, I don't need a sponsor. I'm okay. Rehab did it for me, but yes. again, like they say, it's it's my program. How bad do mm -hmm. I want it? And I wanted it, mm -hmm. and I still want it. Yes. And that's the other thing is, um, it's not just meeting makers make it. You have to come and sit, as they say, all the way down. You mm -hmm. have to be willing. Yes. Um, and 
you know, like I said, even uh, life experiences, it's um, things still come up, mm -hmm. but I am still working a program. And you and I both know that yes. I made a couple of other things more important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so as some things started coming up and I started getting irritable, restless and discontent, even mm -hmm. though I don't want to drink, mm -hmm. I had all of the symptoms. Yes. And that's what scared me yes. was, oh, my gosh, here it comes. And mm -hmm. like people say, oh, I didn't know I was. Just knowing that I had all the symptoms, just mm -hmm. like maybe with the flu or whatever. Yeah. I and you learned, the, learned what to look for mm -hmm. in the 12 step recovery room. Yes. And the thing about the 12 steps is that you constantly are doing them, it is now part of mm -hmm. your everyday life. Yeah. Um, I've learned to pray when I drive. Um, yes. And, you know, let go and let God, which of course that's a hard one for me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and want to run everything and it's like don't work like that I'm not in charge exactly and I I share sometimes in meetings and I only share it because I know that you don't mind you were one of my most challenging fourth step mm -hmm. individuals yes. tell the views about that I'll let you have the floor since it's yours <laughs> Well, um, yeah, during the fourth, now I know why you don't do this in rehab because I kept wanting to do all the steps. I was like, I don't understand why they're only letting us do this one. And so how many do you do in rehabs, by the way, since you brought that up? Um, they, they will, it's really, they stick to one Okay. and they'll do, you can talk about two and three. Okay. And that's it. Yes. Okay. Got yes. You. Um, and now I know why with the fourth step, because, um, I couldn't even buy a vow from Vanna White on accountability. Mm. Um, and so when you, when you had me to do my fourth step, um, I kept saying, I don't see how that is my fault. But as you said, when I realized what was going on and I used these things as, okay. Well, now I get to play the victim. And you're yeah. like, yeah, but you know you're doing that now. Mm -hmm. And so your part is, and it's true, I was, that was my reason to drink. Well, you don't know because I went through this. Mm -hmm. So I would go and pick up. Mm -hmm. And well, I've been through this. And it's like, yeah, but where's your part? My part was I was using that mm -hmm. as That's my an excuse. excuse to stay sick. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I'll just say it. I was torturing other people. I would pick up the phone and I didn't care if you had to go to work tomorrow. I would get, you know, I, I, I may start out drinking happy and it would, my end result would always go back to victim. Mm -hmm. And then I did the DWI, which is dialing while intoxicated. <laughs> and I called everybody that I thought you had done me wrong. Up with these. I did. I called my father. I would, or I would call people. I'm going to kill, you know, it was always, you know, no respect for anybody else because I'm selfish and self-seeking and you're going to listen to me and woe me. And, um, you were trying to explain to me what my, where is my part? And I didn't, you weren't I'm telling laughing me. laughing because I'm, I, I see you. When I was doing that step with you, I could, you were so mad. I was very you were, angry. You left out of that room and you slammed the door. <laughs> and I, I was, I was like, I'm never talking to her again because I, I wanted you to coddle me. I wanted you to go, Oh, poor Kelly. Yeah. Now I see why you did all, but your point was that I've used that for so many years and really it was just making me even sicker and I just continue and emotionally physically and I wasn't willing to come out of it I wanted to hold on to that mm -hmm. instead of work through it yeah. and part of the four step like you told me is it's okay and mm -hmm. but I have to see my part and yes. yes and that that's a real experience that I've had to learn throughout my recovery mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. even um when say I, I get upset with somebody else mm -hmm. um, and I used to be, you know, well, this is my chance because yeah. you, you build resentments. Yeah. 
And then I wait for some, today's the day, let one person make me mad. And it's really not even them, but everything else that is bothering me, I get to take out on them. And you were like, no, because then you have to make an amends. And mm -hmm. we all know I don't like to make an amends. You mentioned that recovery don't walk you through the fourth step, that you do that when you get out. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that because it didn't, it never dawned on me that you just do one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Because the fourth step, as you know, mm -hmm. um, is so personal yes. and you, you really have to dig deep and mm -hmm. a fourth step, yeah. just the first time that you do the fourth step. Yeah. Um, that's just getting started mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you and I both know I've had to yeah. do a fourth step again. Mm -hmm. Yes. This I, almost seven years into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And when you said, yeah. oh, well, do this. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, yeah. as yeah. I'm doing my fourth step again, mm -hmm. I'm like, now I see. Now I see. But I'm willing now. Yes. I'm willing yes. um, to participate in my part yeah. and uh, yeah. admitting faults. You know, um, one thing about recovery is that like, like we all say in here is you never graduate. Mm -hmm. And if you and think rehab is not going to get you through all 12 steps. No. And that's what I'm hearing you say. Exactly. In order for me to see any uh, progress in my program, I've got to work the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. So I need to find another individual. Once I go through rehab, that's why they really encourage encourage you to find a sponsor because they realize that you need to continue those 12 steps yes that's what i'm hearing yes okay yes and i didn't that part i'm glad that we're having this i'm learning something too y'all and I, rehab I've explained in the rehab yeah, exactly and so. that's what i was saying is i thought that still being in rehab i was like i don't understand why you all wouldn't let me do the 12 because i thought after the 12 steps okay, it was, now I'm just going to be in recovery. Uh -huh. But the, you know, the fourth step all the way down to the 12th mm -hmm. is continuous. That's but, the meat of yes. the program. One, two, and three, they're just busy work, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. But the meat of the, the program starts with step four. And we hear that all the time in the 12-step recovery room. Now we're ready to get to work. Yes. So I... I uh, Kelly, I can chat with you forever. We have great meetings together, but um, we're going to have to end it. Um, guys, I hope that you guys have got as much out of this interview as I have. I've learned some things that I didn't even know. Maybe I need to dig more deep when I'm talking to my sponsors. So we're going to wrap it up. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And remember, we love you here at Civil Lining Nation. You guys take care and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, y'all. Bye.